Right now on Movie Review Talk, we have an Oscar contender in Green Book. We have Viola Davis in Widows and the sequel to Fantastic Beasts. Hey there, movie fans. Welcome to Collider's Movie Review Talk. Look at this beautiful panel. <laughs> Super-sized movie review talk this week. Every week on Movie Review Talk, only on Collider. We review the new movies. We pick something like maybe a Blu-ray you might have missed. Maybe something that's streaming that you should check out or not. We'll find out later today. But here's the beauty. No matter what you hear, it is a spoiler-free zone. No spoilers. All right, okay, I fessed up to this last time. Right. Sometimes a spoiler right. speaks through, sneaks through, you know, it it's happens, nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. But we're not saying like, oh my God, he's on Earth the whole time. <laughs> or, Spoilers. but it's a sled, you know. Spoilers. Spoilers, right. right. <laughs> you know. But this week, uh, joining me, you know, we have not two, but three guest critics. First of all, on the way on the other side of this table. <laughs> Hi, Scott. He is a film critic that I love and admire. He's a great writer. He knows more about film than, than, than I do. Oh, that's uh, that a lot of nonsense. But and okay. he is also someone you recognize from the Schmodown. He also has amazing podcasts that he does with the awesome Whitney Seibold. Uh, canceled too soon. I could go on and on about this guy, but right now he's writing awesome film reviews for the rap, William Bibiani, AKA Bibbs. Uh, thank you. God, you're gonna make me cry, Scott. I love you, man. <laughs> oh my God. And so, so flattered. <laughs> joining me, as always, she is my co-pilot on Collider FYC, the awesome, the amazing, the sensational, the invincible, the mighty, paranormal <laughs> activity herself. <laughs> I'm Harry glad you off. used that name, because no matter <laughs> Halloween time or not, I embrace that one. That is just, that was gold. <laughs> was Very normal really activity. Really the most genius idea ever that <laughs> ever, I will ever. never forget. You know, that's so great that, like, it's like the Nightmare Before Christmas. Right. You can use it in Halloween, you can use it <laughs> right. on Christmas. And I got to say, Perry, you know, I just the short time I've gotten to know you these last six months doing Review Talk, right. not only are you a great uh, producer, not only are you a great on-camera critic, you're also a great written film critic. Your written reviews for Collider are sensational. I didn't think you were going there with that. I, I was about to tell you how easy it is to do shows with you and produce for you because you're so wonderful and then you brought my oh, written it's reviews. A no, like, seriously, you're, the written reviews I think are, are, are they're, they're needed. I don't think enough people read written reviews Correct. these days. Uh, so big shout out to both of you for, for keeping that going. And, and, and KJ, thank you so much for being here. This is your thank very, you very first. Thank you Yes, I'm a newbie. You're a newbie <laughs> and you're, you're, you cover film, you cover yes. TV, you cover travel. I cover all of it. You you do it all. Entertainment, travel, I'm your girl for well, all of them. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have you on our show for the first time. Thank yeah, you. Bibbs, I know you've been to Collider a million times before, but this is your first time on Review Talk. And not for lack of trying, so thank <laughs> you for keeping, for having faith in me. I always have faith in you. Well, let's get right to it. The first movie is Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, directed by David Yates. The cast is Eddie Redmayne, Catherine Waterson, Johnny Depp, The Wizarding World's Newt Scamander, must stop the powerful dark wizard Gellert Grindelwald, played by Johnny Depp. Oh, oh my God, this plot. I, I don't even know. Uh, twisting and twisting uh, and twisting and twisting. All right, you take it. You take it. What did you think of this movie? <sighs> Can I be frank? Please. I, you know what? It was a feast for the eyes. Mm -hmm. I think we all were amazed. The cinematography was wonderful. Um, but I didn't love it as much as I loved the first one. Okay, I mean, you did I love know. the first one. I did, I did like the first one. Um, this one, I loved the characters more than I did um, all of the plots, which were intertwined together. There was a lot going on in this film, and at times it could have been hard to follow, even for the diehard J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, Wizardry World people. <laughs> you know, there was a lot uh, thrown in there and a lot to absorb. Um, overall, it was okay. It was definitely okay. It wasn't my favorite uh, wizard film. Um, there could have been a lot more, but I do think that there were some great stella, uh, stellar performances. I mean, of course, I love Jude Law. Um, I love Zoe Kravitz being in there. Uh, Ezra did a great job. Um, didn't mind Johnny Depp. Um, it just didn't somebody. mind Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about as much as I can say now. But, yeah, but you know, I love J.K. Rowling, so I always find it hard um, to critique any of her work at all just because she's such a genius, and I, I just you, you love look for the writing. good stuff. I do. I do, I do. And I, like I said, I think the people who follow this film franchise will will still love it. You know what I mean? Because they, 
They're the diehards. Not you so know. sure about that. Perry, what'd you think? I was pretty unhappy in the screen. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert, but I have seen and loved all the Harry Potter films. I very much enjoyed the first Fantastic wow. Beast. I think it missed the mark compared to those other films a little bit, but I enjoyed the charm of the world. I love the idea of this character in Newt and what he does with all of these fantastic creatures. And I liked what they showed me about that in that first movie. That seems to be completely lost here. I mean, yes. th this series is not about Newt and his magical creatures. It's about all of these other things that I don't understand mm. in the slightest. And, you know, I never want to see a movie give me a big fat exposition dump where I, I feel <laughs> like the movie is treating me like I'm stupid. But in right. this case, I did need a little bit of a refresher as to yeah. what happened in the first movie. I didn't entirely understand a lot of the locations. It's like you say, a feast for the eyes, and I think this could be, but I wouldn't even call it that because if those visuals don't have value and meaning to me, then what's the point? And right. I felt that way about the visuals. And even though I think the performances are fine, I don't think any of them got anything worthwhile to work with. Every There were so many main characters that the movie was telling me were important in this movie that no one really got room to breathe or a meaningful yeah. arc or anything at all. It just went absolutely nowhere for me. And the first thing that I thought when I woke up the next morning after seeing it was, did I take anything from that movie at all? <laughs> no, no, I point? didn't. <laughs> what is the point, William Bibbiani? Uh, I don't know, because the point is I liked it fine. Uh, I actually, I, I'm a fan of the Harry Potter movies. You know who I'm not a fan of actually in the Harry Potter movies is David Yates. I think his really? Harry Potter films tend to illustrate the stories without actually telling them very ah, well. Good point. And I think that was my problem with the first Fantastic Beasts, which I did not care for, even though I really liked a lot of the characters, was we have this really enchanting world. We're introducing you know, new elements of the wizarding world. We're in a new country, new characters. And it didn't seem like he gave a damn about any of them. He was just like, and then Newt did this. Great, who's Newt? I don't know who these people are. By all, by now in this movie, I, we have a refresher course. We know who Newt is. We know, uh, you know, who uh, Catherine Watterson's character is. We know some people in this world. And now that we're grounded, I was okay with it expanding and getting more complicated. I felt like watching this movie. J.K. Rowling wrote the screenplay for these films. Mm -hmm. They're not based on novels, but I felt like she wrote like a 1500 page novel first and then cut it down to movie length. Mm. Yeah. And so like a lot of the other Harry Potter stories where you read the novel and then you see the movie and you realize, okay, Prisoner of Azkaban was great, but there's a lot of stuff they don't actually explain and it actually all makes yeah. sense. I felt like when I was watching this movie, it's complicated, but I felt like it made sense. I felt like it worked within the world, even if I didn't understand every detail. I understood the gist of it, I understood the characters, I understood what they were doing, I understood the context of the action and the adventure, and as a result, I was kind of captivated by how complicated it was. We're not seeing a Harry Potter story told from the perspective of children anymore. We're seeing a Harry Potter story told from the perspective of adults. Yeah. And their, uh, their issues and their dramas and their stories are more complicated and they're more unusual and they're told from a heavier perspective. And I thought this one actually addressed that. So I like this one a lot. Okay, okay, interesting. You liked it, you liked it, you didn't, and I didn't, and here's why. Uh, first of all, I thought the screenplay written by J.K. Rowling, I mean, she she did not base this on a book, even mm -hmm. though you know you're you're you know it feels like she did to you. She didn't, and yep. and uh, it was it was all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all over the place. There was no takeaway from this movie. Uh, I thought it was very convoluted and confusing. The characters were not fully realized. I didn't think the first movie, uh, Fantastic Beasts and uh, Fantastic Boars and Where to Sleep, was all that great either. I thought that was boring as well. I think the bigger problem here. Unfortunately, is David Yates. He did three Harry Potters, the last three Harry Potters, and he did the first Fantastic Beast. Last this four one, Harry Potters. Last four Harry Potters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so again, that's the problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. This, if it, it feels stale, it feels formulaic. It just feels uh, like um, uh, just uh, going by the numbers. They're mm -hmm. going through the motions. It, it, they need to bring in another filmmaker, another director with another vision, just yeah. in the same way that friggin' Alfonso Cuaron came in with the third Harry Potter, mm -hmm. Prisoner of Azkaban, I got made that, that the best I think Cuaron, I think Newell, I think even Chris Columbus, even though his films were more simplified, he understood that, hey, you wanna come visit this wonderful world? Like, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is awesome. David Yates is just like, he inherited like the last part of that franchise when everything started to suck when the world started to get really oppressive and fascistic and miserable and he was 
pretty good for that, but he's applying it to Fantastic Beasts, and we're not getting any of the wonder from this new franchise. We're just inheriting like this humdrum grimness. And he portrays most of his scenes, especially in the first Fantastic Beast, but even here, with this really straightforward, yeah, wizard's pretty depressing, right? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, David, yeah. The biggest no. Thing, the biggest thing the, to simplify all of this to the lowest common denominator, this film loses the most important thing, it's magic. Right, exactly. There, this film is not magical. And any Harry Potter franchise film needs to have magic mm -hmm. at the very top and this film lacks that. I think what was the biggest offense in this movie to me was the fact that as someone who doesn't know every single teeny tiny intricate detail about this universe, the books and the movies included, this made me feel excluded from that. I, mm. I started to feel, feel bad and frustrated because as we left off with those characters in the first film, particularly the foursome, Tina, Newt, um, Jacob, and Queenie, especially Jacob and Queenie, that was the part that really hooked me in that first film. I they found the two great. of them delightful. Where they took their relationship here just sucked yeah. the life out of both of them. But the <laughs> I think thing we all is, can agree on that. <laughs> you would think that after a movie like that, the charm was seeing them all come together and fight for good together and take care of the creatures together. And then this movie rips everybody apart, which I think, as much as I, I do think maybe they need another uh, another director on yep. board to mm -hmm. uh, you know infuse a, a fresh perspective, I also think the script is kind of poorly structured because you have your main characters in all different places. There are no scene transitions whatsoever. It jumps from one thing to the next. Yep. And there were certain scenes where I, at first, could not figure out the tone of the scene or what the movie wanted me to feel. And then all of a sudden, it was almost like the score was there to do the heavy lifting. There, there were certain moments, particularly with Ezra Miller's character, where he walks into a room and I'm like, so like, is this bad? Is this good? Should I like him? And then all of a sudden the score yeah. kicks in and I'm like, oh, that's what you're getting okay, at. Okay, Perry, you and I saw the same movie. Bibbs, your count, your final count on uh, First off, I'm gonna agree with you on this much. There's so many characters that some of them get the short shrift. Mm -hmm. The plot revolves around Ezra Miller. He doesn't get nearly enough screen time. It's hard to tell if he's a protagonist, an antagonist. I'm not calling it this timeless masterpiece of wonder. What I am saying is that for someone who really does engage with the entire Harry Potter franchise, the books, the movies, uh, that seeing the level of detail that this world, that this movie presents, and seeing moments, fleeting, but moments of wonder from David Yates is a great bit with this sort of magic dust when he's investigating, or this great bit with this one underwater monster, all that stuff is really, really great and exciting. I liked seeing this sort of film noir, pre-World War II, you know, intrigue elements. I liked all of that stuff. I think it is a smorgasbord. I think it's a huge breakfast buffet that they just <laughs> shoved onto our plate, and dang it, didn't get enough lobster. All right, your letter grade, KJ. <laughs> What's your letter grade on this movie? A C plus. C plus. Perry? I'm, I'm a C minus. I'm giving it a C minus two. Bibs? B plus. B plus. Whoa, I okay. think overall, I had a really interesting time watching this movie, and I think it's more interesting than a lot of the Harry Potter movies that David Yates makes. Oh. I love the idea of that being a pull quote on the poster. Go yeah. for it. I had an interesting time watching <laughs> this movie. Well, let's just take that and move right along. The next film we're going to talk about is Widows. This movie is directed by Steve McQueen. The cast is Viola Davis, Liam Neeson, Elizabeth Debicki, and Michelle Rodriguez. When their husbands are killed during a heist that goes off the rails, four women with nothing in common come together to clean up their mess. Perry, Widows, take it away. Um, so Widows is kind of split into two movies for me, and I, I think that that was the problem I had with it more so than anything. Obviously, with, uh, with an ensemble like this, especially with Viola Davis in the lead, you're basically guaranteed some stellar lead performances, and Steve, Queen, Steve McQueen definitely had a really good eye for this story. Certain things that he captures in a way where, you know, most of the time you might expect something to be spelled out, or someone to just state something, but it's a different thing to make you feel like that is actually the world they live in, and the one shot that comes to mind is a scene where you have um, Colin Farrell in a car, and it's just the way he captures that drive in the car. You will, you will know exactly what I'm talking about when you see the movie, but it gets a point across very, very clearly without necessarily having to say, this is the way my life is right now. So I really appreciated a lot of that. But when I say it's two different movies, it felt to me like it was striving to be a commercial crowd pleaser while also dealing with a couple of, uh, of maybe kind of like darker, deeper issues that are going on. And the two parts never really came together, never really served each other well to me, okay. where it felt mm -hmm. like they were at odds. So I kept jumping back and forth, but 
This ensemble is something else. Again, Viola Davis. Watch out for Elizabeth Debicki. Yeah, I am right. basically going to guarantee she is going to make waves. And I saw Widows before I saw Bad Times at the El Royale. And I watched this movie. I'm like, Cynthia Erivo gets that much screen time, but she is one of my favorite characters in this movie. Then I went and saw Bad Times, and she crushes oh, it in that. So in that. the two of them are my MVPs of Widows. Bips. Uh, yeah, I feel a lot of the same way Perry does. I think Steve McQueen... I think he is interested in the characters and their heist, but only in a larger context. He's interested in how it affects the politics and the economics of the area in Chicago in which it is set. And that's interesting, but he devotes so much time to politicians talking about raising funds and so little time to the actual experience of the protagonists who are pulling off the heist. You know, a heist is a really intense situation filled with preparation and suspense, and there's a lot on the line. And man, I don't think Steve McQueen cared about all that stuff very much. I never got that feeling of intensity, of uh, excitement or fear from a lot of these characters, even when something ostensibly scary was happening. When I think of a movie like Heat or Set It Off or any of the other like really great heist movies out there, they balance this stuff. It feels like it's taking part of a larger drama, but also the heist is an exciting thing that happens. Here, it's like, oh, isn't it sad that a heist happened? Well, I guess Steve McQueen, but that's uh. not why I bought a ticket. I want to see it balanced, and it just feels like it's, it's, it's totally all over the place. I appreciate the idea to sell it more as a drama, but man, the heist just fell flat to me. KJ Matthews, you're up. Man, I'm listening to both of you guys and I'm saying, did we go to the same movie yeah, theater? Yeah, I did too. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm not getting it. I mean, I think this is one of his best films. I think that when history goes down and they list the top 25 best heist films, Widows will be on that list. Um, the writing was stellar. The acting was stellar, the action was stellar, um, the political divide that you talk about, the authenticity of the political dynasties that we see in places like Chicago and places like Boston, and even it used to be in places like LA, is so palpable on the screen. It's everything is so real. I mean, I, I was thinking to myself, when's the last time I saw a film like that outside of Ocean's Eleven? And I was like, oh, there was Inside Man, but Inside Man wasn't really like a heist film, it was more like crime drama, but it still had that action and the twist and turns without us giving away too much of the film. I just liked it. I mean, you, you've got Liam Neeson, he's bringing his A-game. Of course, you've got Duvall, he's bringing his A-game. Cynthia Revo's bringing her A-game. Uh, Viola Davis never not never does bring her A-game. <laughs> you've got just incredibly interesting characters. And I didn't think they spent too much time on the political dynasty. I love Daniel Kaluuya's uh, uh, kind of screen time and, and who he was in the film and, and how when they weren't with the Colin Farrell character, they kind of turned to who he was and what he was about and kind of how all these these characters were interwoven together. I was never not lost. I never thought, oh, we should have just a little bit more action in this scene or a little less action in this scene. I thought it was just a well-written, well-crafted heist film. One of the best this year and one of the best really ever, in my opinion. I, I, I'm with you on this one. I thought Widows was fantastic. I see your points about, about the balance. But uh, it was not distracting to me. Of course, first of all, just to back up, and Steve McQueen, it's his first, uh, right. first feature since he, his movie, 12 Years a Slave, won the Oscar for Best Picture. Best director that year went to Alfonso Cuaron for Gravity. Uh, but Steve McQueen, what, he set out to make a more mainstream commercial film with, with, uh, with Widows, and he definitely succeeded without, without sacrificing his craft and his art. This is a extremely, uh, there's a lot of depth here, there's a lot going on, but I think that he does balance it pretty well. There wasn't anything that, that I didn't like about the film. I love the characters, I love the scope of it, uh, I love, there's a, there's a couple of really good twists in the film, I'm not gonna spoil what they are, but I didn't see that second one coming and it really did throw me, I really, Upped, upped my love for the film. But the other thing about Widows is uh, I had described it to many people as a female heat. And people are like, yeah, but it's, you know, heat was about cops and robbers. You just have the robbers here. And the point I was trying to make by that comment was just in terms of the structure and the style of it, it felt very much like a Michael Mann film. Mm. Uh, and that's why 
I want with the heat. Well, I, I think Michael, well, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. I think Michael Mann makes movies about professionals and what we have here are amateurs. And I'm not really sensing that real desperation mm. that we get from not being that good at it. There, there are a couple of jokes about it, particularly from Elizabeth Debicki's character, but ultimately it seems like it's running fairly cleanly. For me, the issue I have is that you say he's not sacrificing his art house cred, if you will, but I see that as not making concessions to the mainstream, the pulp, the grindhouse, the heist elements of it. He's he, he, The film is really at odds with it. I like Daniel Kaluuya as this villainous character that he plays, but his character is so broad and so arch. He felt like he stepped out of a James Bond movie where everyone else in the movie is really, really grounded. He's just like menacing bad guy who kills people in unusual ways who listens to NPR in his car. Wow. That's not really the most like in, un, you know, exciting thing for me. And it struck me as kind of this false note. I see that the way that hmm. the politics uh, actually play out and the way that the heist and the politics stories ultimately converge by the end. And I'm not gonna spoil anything obviously, but I see half of the story playing out and having consequences in politics. And literally the other half is completely ignored, even though that would be just as consequential to the ultimate outcome of the story, the grander story in Chicago. I, I see it as just this really unbalanced, kind of messily structured movie that is saved by great acting and impressive, determined style. Ball I think pie. I fall kind of in the middle because even though I find it to be an incredibly uh, disjointed movie that I wish was more cohesive, I do think that on their own, every single thing works really well, just in terms of how one part that I'm thinking about is written and the other part, it's just that they don't merge well. And with, with Daniel Kaluuya, I think that might be one of the most haunting performances I've seen all yeah. year really? he, he freaked yes. me out yeah. and i yeah. think what I enhances yeah, those he's... moments even more is not only is he real i mean especially after get out where you fall in love right. with that character and then seeing him turn on that in like super super it's crazy mean street it it's really really scary but then similar to that uh colin farrell shot i was talking about earlier add in the way mcqueen captures what he does and it makes it even more chilling there's two scenes with him in it that i think are just so beautifully designed from a visual perspective that those are, might be two of my most memorable scenes of the entire year. I, I mean, the, the thing is, I just disagree with you just a little bit. Like, I think Daniel's character is so very real. If you look into um, cities all across the United States now, many times, many of some of the most deprived cities, you walk three blocks away and you're in a perfectly great, well-manicured neighborhood. And this film showed that with the camera angle and the way things were shot when Colin Farrell was in that car. What you're talking about is the direction of that camera angle. Mm -hmm. It's different than what we're usually seeing in films like that. And I like the fact that they tried to show how these communities are so tightly woven together. As much as they hate each other, as much as there's bigotry, as much as there's crime and all these things, look how connected they were. Look how close they were. You go to any city in America and you see that. And I love that authentic nature of I also love Daniel's character because there are so many people like that. You know, yeah, really, like in, in, in real neighborhoods, they don't care about anything that'll shoot up people that look exactly like them all for the money and he represented that villainous thing and so I, I thought it was really authentic I I mean I'm not like that obviously but you know I saw the authenticity in his character and what he was trying to portray you know Pips I, I want to say I, I understand uh, and I've heard other other people and read other other critics say that the that that the uh uh, not so much that the, I, I did feel the desperation in the characters in these four women. Um, I, uh, the, the criticism was that, you know, it, it, for people who don't know what they're doing, they sure look like they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like a, a movie, another heist movie, one that's criminally underseen uh, and underappreciated, which is American Animals, which is a uh. different kind of heist movie where things, things don't go neat at all. And that's the beauty of that movie. Uh, I felt like maybe now, after hearing your criticism of Widows, you know, maybe Widows could have used a little more of that messiness. But I still loved it. I thought it was gripping and intense, tight and taut. I did not think it was too long. I thought it was just, you know, really good, polished, polished filmmaking. And it was gritty without being too gritty, and it was mainstream without without uh, uh, dumbing it down. I want to clarify something before we move on. Uh, mm -hmm. First off. 
I have criticisms of Widows. I have a high standard for my heist movies. It's maybe my favorite genre, aside from maybe dance competition movies. Like, it's those are the two. <laughs> but, like, I heist movies. Step Up Movies. That's hey, a curve. Step Do Up curve 2 up. and Step Up 4 are both heist movies as well. So I'm going to throw it in there. Uh, but, for, for, listen, I reserve some criticisms for this movie. However, it is incredibly well acted. It's very assured. It's clearly what Steve McQueen intended to make. It didn't necessarily have the impact on me that I, you know, would really fully appreciate, but I do think it is too impressive a production to say that it's a bad movie by any stretch. For me, I'm just saying this is why it didn't entirely come together. Like, it just, you know, there were twists. I literally wrote down in my notebook odds of this being the twist at 60%, and it just kept increasing until that was the thing. I thought it was a little predictable. What a great. B. B minus, maybe. Pete Perry. Uh, a B for me. I thought it was uh, great, except for the fact that those two things are at odds. Okay, KJ. I'm a solid A. Okay, I'm giving it an A minus. Okay, you and I are in the same page on this. Yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Okay, moving along to a film that I thought was just a very, very pleasant surprise. The movie is Instant Family, directed by Sean Anders, starring Mark Wahlberg, Rose Byrne, and Isabella Milner. And Pete and Ellie are longing for a family, but when they adopt, Three kids at the same time, they get more than they bargain for. KJ, uh, Perry, I know you haven't seen the film, and I, I know you will after yes. Bibbs and I talk about it. Bibbs, what do you think? <laughs> okay, so Instant Family comes from the director of movies which watching them was the equivalent of being stabbed in the spine to me. Like, it's a guy who made That's My Boy. I really was just like, oh God, please, please let it be okay. This movie's lovely. Yep. This movie stars uh, Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne, and at the beginning of the movie, it seems like it's gonna be a dumb comedy. There's a lot of silly flashbacks. They decide to adopt a, a child, and they end up, through a series of circumstances, adopting three siblings. And that throws their life into turmoil as well it would. And there is a terrible version of this movie that's all about farting and poop and that's not what it's about at all this movie actually slowly like evolves from the silly comedy you think it is to a very earnest and very effective drama that's very frank and open about the emotional and psychological difficulty of adopting kids and being a child who is working through the system and is being constantly rejected and being treated as a commodity hey parents do you want this one no moving on like that has an effect and we see that effect and it is fair and honest and fair about issues of abuse and and the the role that race plays into this sometimes yeah, and it's diverse i appreciated that level of commitment to treating adoption fairly and honestly saying it's a good thing but it's really hard it can be funny and sweet but it's really hard especially when they're grown up like the siblings are in this movie and yeah I like one of them's you, a teenager and she's been through a lot already i as bell motor she was terrific she's in this great movie. i i gotta tell you i just love this film hmm. i went into it thinking the same thing you did it's going to be another poop fart uh daddy's uh, home daddy's home, daddy's daddy's home. home. <laughs> uh you know just just real sort of slapsticky below the belt gross out kind of humor uh that kids are going to like more than grown-ups but i gotta tell you this is instant family is an instant family classic because <laughs> Be like that? An instant family. I think it's a bit much, but okay. Yeah, there you'll see that on the Blu-ray. Okay. Um, but I, I, because it was such a pleasant surprise on every level, because of the way it did treat uh, adoption in a realistic way, it was relatable. It was genuine. It felt honest. Uh, I thought Mark Warburg and Rose Byrne were terrific together. Rose Byrne is just like uh, Hollywood's best kept secret. So great in the, you know. Na uh, uh, Sorority uh, neighbors, neighbors, neighbors um, and, spy. Uh, She's oh, great in everything. I mean, uh, what's the name? Juliet Naked oh, with, uh, yeah. with uh, Ethan Hawke over the summer. That was a great film. Um, but uh, I, I, this was a lovely, wonderful, feel-good crowd pleaser, and I just love the hell out of it. What's your letter grade? Uh, my letter grade is an A minus. Like okay. it, I don't. I think there's a part of it that's a little didactic. It's obviously trying to encourage you. It ends like the last thing before the credits is a website for more information on how to yeah. adopt it. So it's yeah. an ad. I appreciate yeah. that. But it's an honest one, and I think it's fair about the process. And I, yeah, I, I really fell for it. I think it's a very excellently made motion picture. Yeah, I, I give it an A minus. I only dock it a, a little point there just because it did feel a little too long, mm. but. It is still, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. And I think that 
that it's a movie that a lot of people in this day and age are really, really going to embrace and relate to. And I just hope the word gets out. And I hopefully, after reading your review in the rap, yeah, the word will get out. I, I think they're advertising it as a big dumb comedy to try to get the daddy's home crew, and then they're going to get those people, and then they're going to be like, I didn't want to cry. Or and then or they might say, say that it's bad. It's well, not. That it's was not. actually really good. Yeah. You know, they're going to get the daddy's home crowd, and they're going to be like, well, what do you know? That was actually like really, really this good. This is a really that's good such a Thanksgiving shame, film. shame because that's the reason I didn't prioritize right. it, and I didn't, yeah. I didn't go to a screening, and I saw other things instead, and now I'm kicking myself it came over across it. Came slapsticky <laughs> in the trailer, but you know yeah. that often happens. How many? Right. Times have you seen a trailer and you're like, I don't want to see that. You see the film, it's better. Or you see a phenomenal trailer mm -hmm. and then you see the film and you're like, what happened? My ultimate example was I saw this one TV commercial for August Osage County, which is one of the oh. bitterest and most mean-spirited movies of the last decade. Yeah. And it was portrayed as a fun comedy for Christmas. <laughs> oh, People yeah. ask me, why do we need critics? This is one of the reasons why, to tell yeah. you what a movie actually is, because the the ads lie to yeah, get you all the time. I remember, they, they sold all that the as a time. comedy. I'm like, how the hell is August Osage County a comedy? Okay, moving on to the movie. I really, I really couldn't wait to talk about this one. Uh, this is a movie that really just sort of went to the top of my list for the year. Um, it's Green Book, directed by Peter Farrelly, starring Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali, based on the true story of the unlikely friendship that develops between an, an Italian-American bouncer and the African-American classical pianist. He has to drive across the Deep South in 1962. KJ, when you see this movie, we're gonna have another conversation about it. Absolutely. Perry, you saw it. Bibbs, you saw it. Perry, what'd you think? I adore this movie. I, I can't wait to see it again, but not just another time. I mean, again and again and again, and to tell everybody about it. This is another one of those movies where at first I didn't prioritize it. You know, when you go to TIFF, you make the must-see list and it's mostly all the movies that everyone's talking about. And sure this enough, this was the one that walked away with the audience award. And then I was so mad at myself, but I went looking for that first screening I could get back in LA and I saw it and I felt what everybody else told me they felt at Toronto. This is a very, very special film. And Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali are so good together. Their chemistry is impeccable. Their comedic timing, too, because yep. obviously we know Peter Farrelly isn't really well known for dramatic movies, but right. this is one <laughs> that balances some really, truly funny moments with some real important drama that matters, and the pairing is spot on. Just watching the two of them grow throughout the movie, but do so in a way where it's not like, you're different, you should change or be like me or anything like that. It's about understanding how somebody else is and adapting to that, but also embracing the things that, you, that make you different at the same time. And having those two things go side by side through a journey like this, it just left me in a place that, I don't know, like, I just, I felt good about being surrounded by so many different people, and I feel like that's wow. part of the reason why everyone needs to go see Green Book. All right, Perry, here's the thing. And KJ, wow. so, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Perry. I'm like, is she, is I'm she like, speaking she, for, she should I'm be the American, right now. like, poster child. Okay, but see, now, now here's where the she conversation. She sounds amazing. Here's where the conversation is going to get interesting. Bibs. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh -oh. Green Book. I want to. I want to start off on a positive note. Yeah. Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali are two of the best actors working today, and they show it in this movie. Mm. They are fantastic in uh -oh. this movie. I 100% agree okay. with that in every conceivable way. Uh, for me, the words that come to mind by the time the credits rolled on Green Book were disingenuous cop out. For me, I look at this movie and its portrayal of the 1950s through the perspective of these real life characters, true, but the way that they choose to portray them strikes me as this incredibly simplistic and very reassuring portrayal of these people. Now, the world in which they live, this is about uh, Viggo Mortensen driving Doc Shirley, uh, you know, acclaimed uh, classical yes. musician mm -hmm. uh, through a tour in the Deep South and along the way they encounter a lot of racism. Sure. But what I thought was really frustrating was the way that the movie is desperate to make Viggo Mortensen have like off, let him off the hook in every conceivable way. They show him being racist in one moment, in one scene at the beginning of the movie, and then after that, that element of his character is gone and he has nothing left to learn other than Doc Shirley is pretty cool and maybe he should write better letters to his wife. That is a really frustrating thing for me because he ends up doing all of the work that I see. I end up seeing him teaching Doc Shirley 
kind of everything. He ends up teaching Doc Shirley how to appreciate black culture more than Doc Shirley does. And there's something that strikes me as frustratingly condescending to give that much effort. This movie is trying to create a parallel between class uh, dynamics and racial dynamics in the mid 20th century by saying that Viggo Mortensen as an undereducated white working class man is on the same level as Doc Shirley socially. Mm -hmm. But what the movie never addresses is that in order to be on the same level as this undereducated white working class man, Doc Shirley literally has to be one of the most accomplished human beings on the planet, and the movie never addresses that inequality to me. Okay, I will say this. Hmm. I see your point. I do see your point. But the movie works on every, every other level that, okay, just Isn't that on. an important level? But, well, th <laughs> that is, that is an important level. Of course it is. Like okay. I just said, I see your point. Okay. But I've seen the movie three times now, and each time I saw the film, I was definitely struck by Yes, the chemistry between Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali. This movie has a lot of heart, it has a lot of humor, and just like Instant Family, but for different reasons, it is a feel-good crowd pleaser. The movie was made for about, I think like 23 million over 28 days. And what I love about the film, among other things, is how refreshingly straightforward it is. There's nothing flashy, no gimmicky editing, cutting techniques. It, it just tells the story. There's something refreshingly old fashioned about the way it's told and the directing style of it that they just don't really make movies like this anymore and here one exists. Uh, it is a movie that does make you feel good. In the end, uh, you know, they don't sell it this way and I guess I, I see why they wouldn't, but in the end it is actually a Christmas movie. It's true, it is. Okay, it is a Christmas movie yeah. and I think that when you have other movies on the like, list of best Christmas films, like I mean, even Die Hard is listed, as it should be, as a great Christmas movie, I think that Green Book will be seen mm -hmm. as soon as work gets more work gets out about it as a great Christmas movie. And I, yeah, I agree with you. I see that the scales are definitely tipped. Uh, it's not a balanced learning process between Vigo and Mahershala in this movie. But overall, I just felt it, it was so irresistibly charming and endearing, and I did feel the heart of it. And, uh, you know, it does feel very mainstream, and I thought that Peter Farrelly, who has, with his brother Bobby, has done, like, you know, something about Mary, Dumb and Dumber, Shallow Howe, um, you know, I, I thought it was great to see him do something that still had humor, played to his strengths there, but he can do a dramatic uh, a direction as well. Uh, I thought it was very quotable. And going back to what you said at the top of your talk there, Perry, it is a movie that I will absolutely see over and over and over again. It's a movie that if it's on cable, if I ever decide to get cable back, um, and I'm coming across it, I flip it across it, I'll leave it on. I can't wait to get the Blu-ray. I can't wait to download it to my, my tablets, my computer, my iPad. I just love the hell out of this movie. And, and I really do think that, you know, when I was late to the game, like you were, Perry. I did see it at TIFF, and I feel like we missed out. But when we did see it, I'm like, you know what? This is the movie of the year. This is the one to beat for Best Picture. It deserves to be. I think it's a wonderful film. Again, I see your point, right. but it didn't uh, It didn't overwhelm all the other great aspects of the for movie. For me, and, I'm, and I'll, I'll try to make this quick because I know we're... but. You say it's a, it's a feel-good film, and you, yep. they want you to feel good. And I know that when I think about racial relations in the mid-20th century in the Deep South, what I want to do is feel good. I don't know if that's fair. I think that's actually selling the subject really short. Mm -hmm. I think that they end up reducing a really important topic into something that is incredibly simplistic and mainstream and reassuring in a way that people can go, yeah, racism is bad, but not actually explore it in a meaningful way between two characters who, and yeah, they had a real life relationship. They have a lot to offer each other, but yeah, I, I, I ended up feeling good and then I felt bad uh, about Perry. how good this movie made me feel. Perry. So in, in thinking about that, I definitely do see where you're coming from as well. Where I think this really worked for me though is how good they all are at putting you in these characters' mm. shoes because they're both in a, in a situation where they're not, like he can't fully understand what Doc Shirley is going through down in the South. So it's letting you see how he is impacted by that situation and then with Doc, Doc Shirley and, and just the fact that like he isn't in tune with all of that culture that Viggo, Morton is so, Viggo Mortensen's character is so well aware of, it just all converged in a way that I've never really experienced before. So it was, I appreciated the opportunity to step into someone else's shoes and get a different perspective, one that I didn't really expect. Because if you hear about a story like this, and I mean just like a one sentence log line, it's like, oh, like I, I know where that's gonna head. But no, these are, especially with Doc Shirley, he's in a position where 
like he's so isolated and that that really kind of crushed me throughout the yeah, movie and he right. had to open himself up to other things no matter what your race is what your background is what your sexual orientation is he just goes through this whole journey having to be open to everything and understanding everything and, and assessing himself and i was kind of just so overwhelmed by all of that flooding into his yep. life while that while that isolation that he feels is still there but anyway in terms of this being a crowd pleaser i think the thing that I held so tight to at the end of it was that making, and I'm not using this as an excuse, but making it such a charming crowd pleaser, it it's, gives you the opportunity to push good messages out there even more so, where I think we do need the things that really dig deep into these issues and maybe give you a more difficult watch. But with this, the thought of this movie being out there and me being able to tell the masses that this is something that will bring something good to your life, yep. I am holding so tight to that right now, and I'm just so thankful this movie exists. <laughs> I agree with you completely. Fair, yeah. What's your letter grade, Perry? Uh, my letter grade for this is an A-. minus. Mine's an A, Bibs. Come on, bring it down. It's okay. Performances are really good. I'll give it a C+. Plus. Uh, ooh. Wow, that hurts. Yeah. All right, but I respect your opinion. Okay, all right. moving on to, you know, like with all the streaming services these days, yeah. there's a lot to watch. I mean, you got the movies in theaters, you got the Blu-rays, and you know, now that Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu are stepping up the game on the film side, mm -hmm. you got movies to watch on, on those as well. This one is coming from Netflix. It's streaming now, so you don't have to wait for it. It is called Outlaw King. It's directed by David McKenzie, who wrote and directed Hell or High Water. The movie stars Chris Pine, Aaron Taylor Johnson, based on the true story of Robert the Bruce, the Scottish outlaw king who overcame the odds to defeat the much larger and better equipped English army in the 14th century. KJ, what do you think? This is a lot. You know, here's the thing, here's the thing. I think the problem, I should not have watched this film at like seven o'clock in the morning. Maybe that's probably. Maybe was, <laughs> you watch it seven o'clock. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe I needed to see it at seven p.m. I don't know. I'm not suggesting that you have to time your films on Netflix. Um, I compared this a lot, obviously, to Braveheart. Oh, you you're know, not the only I, I, I'm, one. I'm not the only one. I think every anybody who sees this film will do that. It's got the Scottish King thing. It's a medieval film. Um, Mackenzie is from Scotland, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so is uh, not Chris Pine, but his films are pretty much set into that character. And so, if you like medieval films, if you like historical films, you might like this. I like the way it was shot. I love the action sequences, but the story was disjointed to me. Um, there were a lot of things that I thought could have been better connected. I didn't think it needed to be this long. There were certain scenes that could have been cut out. There were times where they were long on certain scenes that I thought we could have cut that to like a 30 seconds off of that. And then there were other scenes that I wanted to see them expand on. Um, I love Chris Pine. I mean, he can do no wrong, Mr. Star Trek. For me, um, I, really, I really do love him and I was rooting for this film, um, but I walked away wanting more. Okay, Perry. Um, I did not see this one. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. I missed, missed this one at Tiff as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I'm, I'm with you, actually, okay. in, a, in a lot of ways. I, I'm impressed with the scale of this production. There's a lot of really incredible, like, one-take shots where you really get a lot of different perspectives. And that's a really, really cool production. And I think the action is very, very exciting. But the story is dull as dishwater. Yeah. I think this is Braveheart without an emotional hook. Yeah, It's like, you want to see all the stuff in Braveheart? It looks just as cool as Braveheart, but you don't care that's Outlaw King. And I think yeah. a lot of it is the screenplay. I think it's yes. very obtuse. I think if you haven't just watched Braveheart, because Chris Pine's character is the same character Angus McFadden right. played in Braveheart. It's not officially a sequel, but you kind of need to watch them both back together unless you know your history. Because right. William Wallace is mentioned a lot. He's an important plot point, even though you never see him. Mm -hmm. At least not all of them. And uh -huh. you got... Uh, but Chris Pine... His character is kind of just shuffled around Correct. by incident and politics. He's got a romance. I never felt it. Mm -hmm. I never cared. Chris Pine is a wonderful actor, yeah, but with rare great. exception, I'm including Heller High Water in this, he's a better charmer than yeah. I think he is a serious actor who can carry a lot of emotional gravitas. And so you see a film like, I don't know, People Like Us. and you People see him, Like Us is great. I, I, I see him struggling movie. in that movie, but whatever. My point is, <laughs> my point is, I don't think this is his wheelhouse. Yeah. I don't think, I, for his Scottish accent is meh. But like beyond <laughs> that, I, he's not bringing it. He's not giving me the gravitas the character needs. He's not bringing me the tragedy the character needs. He's just kind of there. And the movie desperately needs more than that because it's a huge 
a yeah. huge production Curious. with a lot going on, and man, I need to care. Well, and I, 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 I listen. I agree with both of you. The look of the film. I mean, it's an epic scale. The medieval battles, the costume design, the bleakness, the uh, the just the dirtiness of of living during that time period. I mean, it's, everything's always muddy. I mean, but. The story didn't grab me. The characters didn't grab me. Uh, the story didn't. Uh, it, it just felt like it just sort of uh, was was stitched together without without feeling, without emotion. And in the end, um, uh, just in terms of the look of it, it's been done. It was called Braveheart, and it's gonna. If you're gonna compare Outlaw King to Braveheart, Outlaw King is gonna be compared unfavorably because Braveheart is Braveheart won the Oscar for Best Picture in 1995. So, all right, letter grade. Oh, it's definitely just a C minus, and I'm being kind. Yeah, you know? yeah, me too. I mean, I'm gonna give it a C just because, like, I think the action's cool, and if you just want to like ignore the plot and just cut to all the beheadings and stuff, you're gonna be like, dude, this is awesome. But if you're actually paying attention to the story, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Well, I cannot thank all of you enough <laughs> for being here. For this is a jam-packed, super-sized movie review talk. KJ, where can people find you? KJ Matthews TV on both Twitter and Instagram. All right, Perry. Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff, and check out Collider FYC. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, where am I? Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, I host the podcast Critically Acclaimed on the Schmozno Network. I also host the podcast Cancel Too Soon, where we review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. And I'm on Twitter at William Bibiani. Check out my reviews on IGN and The Wrap. And make sure you catch me at Movie Mance on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you share Collider's movie review talk with everyone you know. Got to get the word out. You know, these type of review shows, they need support from people who love movies. And I love doing this show, and I love doing it with my friends here at Collider. And uh, we come back week after week to review movies. And I think we're going to skip over Thanksgiving week. So we'll be back the week after Thanksgiving. And until then, here's looking at you, kid. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.